Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 195 of our YouTube channel and podcast, and I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think could be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. Today, I want to specifically drill down uh, on the different types of ways that you can save for your children and specifically how we can invest money for our children's future, whether that be uh, money for their education or just money for uh, them to start their lives uh, with a step ahead of others by having something to put down on a house or, or to buy a new car with or whatever it may be. We are going to talk about some specific ways that we can go about giving our kids a head start uh, and the ways that we can actively save for that. And it's probably a lot easier and simpler than you may think. Before we get started, though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, and be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to create a financial plan that's specific to you and your family's needs and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just go to my website, www.mnowithdylan.com. Click on the Work with Dylan tab, and you can choose the financial coaching session type that would work best for you, and we can begin pushing towards your long-term financial goals together. Now, I don't know about you guys, uh, but growing up, I always knew uh, that I was going to have to figure out a way to get college paid for. And I was going to have to figure out a way uh, when I began my working life, right, uh, to save money and have money set aside for myself. And this is the reality for the vast majority of us out there. But I can't help but wonder uh, what would be different, maybe the head start that I would have had uh, if there would have been some college savings account set aside uh, or some uh, you know, custodial account that had money set aside that I could use uh, to go into the next phase of life. And so I really want to talk about those things today, not just specifically so we can make sure that we have all this money set aside for our kids. No, but uh, to give our kids something uh, that is going to be positive, right? Because we know that student loans are eating away uh, at the wealth of many, not just young people, right? But people who have had student loans for years and years and are consistently having to pay them month after month after month. And that debt is a detriment uh, to people's ability to build wealth. But if people had uh, some type of educational savings account, some type of 529 or some type of custodial account that they could have taken money from and pay for their education in cash, uh, that would have made a whole world of difference. Now, we obviously have a very uh, distorted view of what education should look like in the U.S. today and uh, how we should go about funding our education and if education is actually worth uh, the money that we are taking out in loans and the student loan debt in order to uh, pay for that education. But regardless of having that distorted view, right, if school is still going to cost something and uh, the price of university has done nothing but rise uh, over the last 30, 40, 50 years, and if that is going to continue and there seems to be no end in sight, even though uh, you hear about all these policies of free college all the time, but the likelihood still remains very slim that that could ever occur, right? If this continues, then we need to make sure that we are doing something for our children uh, in order to set them up in the best way possible. Because do you want your children to be having student loan debt that's going to pull them down and keep them from building wealth and keep them from buying a house and moving out of your house and keep them from uh, starting a life that they want to start? Of course not. You want to uh, create the smoothest transition from life in your house to life outside of your house for your child. Uh, and none of this is to say that we need to just give our kids handouts. Having money set aside for a child should always be contingent. It should always be contingent on uh, that child's lifestyle, how they are doing in school if you're paying for their education. Uh, it should always be contingent on uh, the, the morality that you have instilled in them and whether or not they are living that out in their daily life or the uh, beliefs that you have instilled in them and whether or not they're living that thing out. It is still your money. You can uh, be very picky as to how you choose uh, to give money to your children or to allocate money towards your children when it comes to their education and then uh, as they move forward in life. Now, there are several options uh, that you have in doing this, right? You can 
uh, you know, just save money in a savings account. There are plenty of people who have done that, and uh, it's been effective, and they've been able to pay for their kids' school, and they've been able to uh, set aside money for their kids' future, right? But there are other ways that we can go about actually growing the money, actually allowing uh, the money that we put away to compound and grow for our child's future. Uh, and these come in several different forms, and we're going to talk about what those forms are today. But I do want to give you a few examples just before we get into the types of accounts. Uh, but I just want to show you how easy it is to save a substantial amount of money uh, for your child or for their education or for uh, whatever it may be in their life that uh, you're trying to put away money for. Uh, it is not as hard as you think it is. Now, we're going to set the type of account aside for a moment, but we're just going to assume that we are investing for our child's future. We are putting money away that is being invested. And I'm assuming just an 8% rate of return in these uh, different examples. And that 8% rate of return is going to be over an 18 year period because we're just saying, hey, start as soon as your child is born and then invest all the way until they are 18 years old. Okay. So if you made that 8% rate of return and you just put away $100 a month, you just said, okay, $100 a month from the day they're born to when they're 18 years old, what you would end up having set aside for them is over $48,000. That's no slouch when it comes to uh, a good amount of money. Now, is that going to pay for all of their college? Maybe not, but a little burden falls on your child as far as, you know, let's get some scholarships or let's, uh, you know, apply for loans or let's get some type of athletic scholarship or let's do something to help pay for school in other ways or let's go to community college for a couple years uh, to help, uh, you know, decrease the burden uh, for paying for school, but $48,000 is better than nothing. And that is just at $100 a month that you're saving at 8%. Obviously, if you make a higher rate of return, that amount of money increases. And as I'm about to show you, if the amount of money that you put away increases, obviously that amount increases as well. Okay, so let's say instead of 100, we are doing $200 a month. Well, that doubles the amount of money that you would have put away at that 8% over 18 years. And that is $96,000. Now, uh, for most affordable state schools, good, decent schools, right? Uh, $96,000, at least today, should cover your education. Okay, now that's not to say that it will 18 years from now, okay? But it'll definitely give them a really good head start. It'll really give them uh, a step forward on others who can't pay for school. And if you say, well, I don't think that's going to be anywhere close to enough, uh, you know, maybe I need to save more. Well, at $300 a month, still at 8% over 18 years, then you are still looking at $144,000 approximately that you would have put away for your kid's future. These are not huge amounts of money, right? $100, $200, $300 a month. Many people spend uh, that, if not you know, two, three times more on car payments every month, right? Uh, and so if you say that you can't do this, maybe your priorities are a little out of whack. Now, you may also be saying, well, what about saving for retirement, right? I, I need to be saving for my retirement and I need to be putting money away for my future and so I can live and so I can have money to uh, retire on. And that is absolutely true. And I want to make this extremely clear. Uh, the money that you save for your kids should not trump the money that you end up saving for yourself because you are going to have to retire regardless, okay? They can ultimately figure it out for themselves. They can ultimately uh, you know, work through the weeds if they absolutely have to. But if we have the choice, if we have the choice uh, to give them a head start or not, then of course we would want to give them a head start. So we're talking about in an ideal situation, we would like this to be the case. And when it comes to the financial action plan, right, we are only going to be putting money away for our children once we are putting away at least 15% of our income for our own future, right? Because that's the sixth part of the financial action plan after we are out of debt and have built a fully funded emergency fund of four to six months uh, of household expenses, right? Then we start investing at least 15% for ourselves, right? Investing 15% for our future. Okay. So above that 15% can be money that you put away for your child and you can put it away uh, in several different vehicles. Like I said, that we are going to talk about uh, as we move forward in this episode. But I just want you to be aware that it is not that difficult, right? You buy an S&P 500 index fund, you feed money into that S&P 500 index fund for 18 years, you are going to be left with something fairly substantial, even with putting away $100, $200, $300 a month, 
right? And you may say, well, what if I have three kids? You expect me to put away $300 a month for three kids? Well, not necessarily, okay? That's not what I'm getting at. But what I'm getting at is let's say you can put $100 a month away for each of your three kids, right? That's $300 and they can each have close to $50,000 or maybe even more if the rate of return were higher over that 18 years. Uh, and then they can take that and use that for uh, their educational expenses, they can use that for their future. And so this is just a really good way and a really simple way that we can go about putting money away for our children. And that's just putting away small amounts, putting it away incrementally, putting it away in a systematic fashion in the same way that we save money for our own retirement, right? We save money for our own retirement by every single month, putting away a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then that money will compound on itself. Right now, obviously, we want to be investing in things that are going to make good rates of return and are going to provide good value for uh, our children when they get to age 18. Uh, but then the question becomes, when they get to age 18, should it all be for their education? Should it not all be for their education? Should we have control of it or should we just give them the money? What should we do when it comes to the money that we put away uh, for our kids' future? And so that's when we jump into the account types. Okay, there are multiple different types of accounts that you can put money away in uh, for your child's future. Now, I'm going to start with the simplest, okay, and the most straightforward, and then we'll kind of work into the weeds a little bit uh, into some of the different account types that you may hear of that actually can be very, very useful. And I'll just tell you the types of uh, plans that I have for uh, this type of situation because my wife and I, we are uh, expecting a, a child in June, and uh, you know, when he is born, we're going to have to. Um, you know, make the decisions as to what we are going to do. And so I've already got that kind of planned out. We've talked about that and we kind of know what we want to do. And I'll give you some of those pointers as we go through uh, these different account types. But we'll just start uh, with the most basic type. Uh, and that is just a simple brokerage account, a simple taxable brokerage account. Okay. Now, if nothing else, if you put some money away for your kid's future, you can put it away in a taxable brokerage account that is in just your name or yours and your spouse's name. Uh, that way you guys are still the owner of that money. That money is not the child's, that money is your money. Okay, and you can put the money away and allow it to grow and grow and grow and basically just earmark that money for your child. Now, there are zero tax benefits to this type of account. And we've talked about the brokerage account many, many times. Right? We know that you know, any money that you invest, you let it grow. Well, as long as you do not uh, realize gains, meaning sell something for a gain, there are no taxes. Okay? But once you sell something for a gain, uh, then that is taxable if you held it for more than a year at the long-term capital gains rate or if you held it for less than a year uh, at the uh, short-term capital gains, which is your income tax rate. And so the brokerage account just makes it very simple because it's still your money. It's money that, you know, if your child doesn't go to school or, you know, your child has made bad decisions and you don't want to fund their bad decisions or uh, you, you just have more flexibility with this money, right? You have more uh, choices with this money because it's in your name. It's going to stay in your name and it has not been predetermined what that money is specifically for. Okay. And so. These brokerage accounts are going to make it very easy, make it very flexible to save money for your children uh, and not leave you with a bunch of restrictions as to what you can and cannot do with money and not leave you with any restrictions as to whose money it is uh, when the child turns 18. Okay, so I'll just tell you that my wife and I, we do plan to put a vast majority of the money uh, that we're going to put away for our son and for any subsequent children that we may have uh, into brokerage accounts, okay? And uh, we just think that this provides really good flexibility and provides us with uh, the ability to grow the money. Or if we don't want to use the money specifically for the child's education or the child doesn't go to school uh, or they make bad decisions or whatever, right? It leaves the decision making up to us. It allows us to determine what we want to do with the money. Uh, it doesn't give some uh, predetermined ideas as to where the money will go uh, when the child is of age, okay? So um, I, I will be using a brokerage account. Right. But that's not the only type of these accounts that I will be using or that I plan to be using. And that's not to say that the rest of these accounts are bad accounts to have. They have their advantages. And you may think that the advantages of these other accounts outweighs uh, the advantages of just a basic flexible brokerage account. Right. But uh, that is 100 percent up 
to you. That is 100% up to your own decision making because uh, I just want to give you all the information. I want to educate you on these different types of accounts and allow you to make your own decisions. Uh, I like brokerage accounts because of their flexibility. I like brokerage accounts because it is my money and I can make the decisions. Uh, but you may like the fact that you can earmark money specifically for your child's education uh, and that keeps you from using it for any other reason than that child's education. And if that's something that you are particularly interested in, you might be interested in a 529 plan. And so that's the next type of account that we are going to talk about, right? Now, the 529 plan is a tax advantage savings plan uh, that is designed to help you pay for education, right? It was originally limited to post-secondary education, so originally limited to just a uh, university, but it was expanded to cover K-12 through education in 2017 and apprenticeship programs in 2019, Okay, so what a 529 plan does, it earmarks money specifically for education. You're putting money away into a 529 plan and it can only be used for the education of the beneficiary of that account. Now, you as the parent or the guardian or whomever still have control over uh, the disbursement of funds when it comes to that money, right? That money is still your money. So you get to choose how it's allocated but it can only be used for the educational expenses of uh, the child that is the named beneficiary for the account. So there are two basic types of 529 plans. There are savings plans and prepaid tuition plans. Uh, we don't want to mess with the prepaid tuition plans because we don't know how much stuff is going to cost in the future. And we would like to be putting money away and allowing that money to grow at a good clip for us in some good investments uh, as we you know, save for our kids' future. And so the savings plan is going to be what you look for. Now, each state has their own specific 529 plan. Some states have really good options within their 529 plans, and some states do not. So you are going to need to look at uh, the 529 plan that is available to you and see if it is going to earn an adequate rate of return uh, and if it has any extra restrictions uh, that you may not want uh, when it comes to uh, saving for your kids' future, okay? Now, one specific benefit of the 529 plan is its tax advantage nature. Okay, so savings plans, uh, saving 529 plans, right? They grow tax deferred. So you put money away and the money grows in a tax deferred way and withdrawals are tax free if they're used for qualified educational expenses, okay? So you get to put this money away, it gets to grow in a tax deferred manner and you get to take some tax free withdrawals uh, from this money, which is extremely helpful, right? Instead of in the brokerage account where you're having to pay taxes on any gains once they're realized, right? With the 529, any money that you withdraw and you take out specifically for education uh, it will not be taxed in any way, shape, or form. And that is advantageous. That is a, a very good advantage of the 529. The biggest downside of the 529 is that it can only be used for educational expenses. Now, you could use it for something else, but you would have to pay uh, the taxes and uh, there may be subsequent penalties with the specific type of 529 that you put money away in. Okay, but I don't think this is a bad plan. I think it's you know very good plan to use and a lot of people actually use 529 plans to save for their kids' education. Uh, but you're just gonna have to keep in mind whether or not you think that uh, saving for education in an aggressive way uh, is going to be beneficial for your child 18 years from now. And it may absolutely be, it may be worth it to you, but just remember that that money can only be spent for that particular purpose. Okay. Now, some 529 plans, they also have uh, some state tax deductions if you are making contributions uh, to that state's 529s. And so uh, that's something else that you could actually be looking into as well. Okay. So there's the 529 plan. You can make the decision for yourself whether or not you like it, whether or not you don't, right? But it is a specific choice and it is a tax advantage choice uh, for saving for your kid's education. Then that brings us to the next type of account and that is the Coverdell ESA or Educational Savings Account. Sometimes you'll just see it written as an ESA, okay? Now the ESA is a tax deferred trust account created by the US government to assist families in funding educational expenses for beneficiaries who are 18 years or younger when the account is established, okay? So with the ESA, right, you can put away up to $2,000 per year for a beneficiary in a similar way to how you can put away money in a 529. Now, something I did not cover in the 529 that I'll give you real quick is that the 529, you can put away up to uh, the gift limit for that particular year. So with the 529, you can put into it 
up to the annual gift tax exclusion uh, that is set out by the IRS per beneficiary per year. Okay, so for 2021, that is $15,000 uh, per individual, right? So if you wanted to put money into uh, your kids' 529 plans, you could put away $15,000 per year per child uh, and not run into any issues. Now, anything above that, you would have to pay gift tax uh, on that money, which is um, a pretty substantial tax uh, and something that you would need to keep in mind. But again, with the Coverdell ESA, uh, each beneficiary can only have up to $2,000 put away per person. Now, this has also been called an educational IRA, right? Because the ESA allows families to increase investment earnings through tax deferral as long as the funds are used for educational purposes. Again, these funds must be used for educational purposes, okay? Now, if you contributed like $500 to an ESA and it appreciated to $5,000 in 10 years, the earnings would not be taxed. This is the tax deferral I was talking about with the 529, and it is the same here with the ESA. Now, something else specific to the Coverdale ESA is that all Coverdale funds must be used by the time the student is age 30 or taxes, fees, and penalties will accompany any withdrawals that you make. Okay, so there is an age limit here that you have to make sure that the money is used by that time. Okay, now when the contributions are distributed, right, you make contributions, they grow, you've got them invested, they grow, and then you take them out, they are tax-free withdrawals. Uh, assuming that they are less than the account holder's annual adjusted qualified educational expenses, including tuition, books, equipment, special needs services, and even academic tutoring. Okay, now ESA accounts can be used for primary and secondary schools, K through 12, as well as higher education in the same way as the 529. So the way I think of the ESA is very similar to the 529, uh, but with less upside, right? The 529 gives you a little more flexibility, uh, but they are different on a state-by-state -state basis. The Coverdell ESA uh, is just an overarching type of account, but it doesn't allow you to contribute as much and it gives you that limitation of the age by which it must be used. Now, I don't know about the ESA, but I know specifically for the 529, uh, if you do not use a 529 or the entire 529 for one child, uh, you can move it to another beneficiary, another child, which can be really useful and allow you to use that money for someone's educational expenses. Okay. Now, ESAs may be established at brokerage and other financial institutions. Uh, these accounts are comparable to the 529. Okay. Now, again, there's no annual limit on the 529, but if you put in more than that annual gift tax exclusion, uh, there will be tax implications. Now, something interesting about the 529 that is not the case for the ESA, right, is that 529 plans can now be used to pay off up to $10,000 in student loans and to pay for qualified expenses related to apprenticeship programs uh, as approved by the U.S. Department of Labor. So they can be used to pay off student loans if you have a 529 laying around. But if you've got a 529 laying around, the likelihood uh, that you have student loans is actually very low. Now, there are no restrictions on the income level of contributors to 529s. Uh, however, fees can be extracted from the 529s and investment can also uh, lose money as there's no guarantee on returns, okay? Now, like I said, the 529 and the ESA are very, very similar in form uh, and it's really up to you as to what you wanna use these things for and the benefits and the drawbacks that uh, each of the types of accounts have. If I could choose though, I would say that the 529 is probably a better account for most people uh, than the ESA. Uh, but again, this is totally up to you. You should be the one that chooses the type of account that you should put away money uh, for your children in, okay? Then, lastly, I wanna talk about UTMA and UGMA accounts, okay? Now, UTMA stands for, U-T-M-A, UTMA, stands for the Uniform Transfer to Minors Act, okay? And then the UGMA stands for the Uniform Gifts to Minors Act, okay? Now, these two types of accounts are very, very similar in form, right? And they are not specifically for educational expenses. So if you're like, I, I like those other two accounts, I like their uh, benefits, but why are they just for educational expenses? What if I don't want to spend the money just on educational expenses? Well, UTMAs and UGMAs may be the choice for you. Okay, so uh, custodial accounts are exactly what UTMAs and UGMAs are, right? You put your name and your child's name on this specific account. You are the custodian of this account right? And you can save for the minor. You can save for the child, right? But when the child turns 18 years old, the money is their money, okay? So this is probably the biggest drawback of the UTMA or UGMA account uh, is that once they reach 18 years old, that money is their money, 
Now that is 18 years old for most states. Some states it's up to 25 years old, but the account must be turned over to the child. Eventually it will be their money. Money put into a custodial account is an irrevocable gift to the minor named as the beneficiary. So whomever you put as the beneficiary to that account, that is their money. You can't just take that money out because you don't agree with their lifestyle choices or whatever, or you know you want to put that money somewhere else. You cannot do that. That is their money. The custodian must ensure that it is invested or used for the minor's benefit. Okay. Now, UTMAs and UGMAs, they can be used for the minor's benefit when it comes to doing things like purchasing a first car or any type of event that would specifically benefit uh, the minor before they uh, become the owners of the funds that you have put away. Now, there is no limit to the amount of money that you can put into an UGMA or UTMA, but gifts to an individual above $15,000 a year, uh, they require a form for the IRS because that goes over the annual gift tax exclusion. Okay, uh, Realized earnings on a custodial account are taxable in a similar way to brokerage accounts, right? And you have little control over how the money is used. Once the assets are transferred, the beneficiary can use them for any purpose. Like I said, each state has different rules for determining the age of termination when the beneficiary should take over the account. Okay, And UTMAs and UGMAs can impact financial aid for a student. Financial aid can be adversely affected by custodial accounts because they are considered to be assets that are owned by that student or by that minor, by that child. Right? They are considered their assets. And given that they are considered their assets, uh, it can impact their ability to get financial aid if financial aid is still needed. Okay, uh, So you can see that there's upside here because there is flexibility. You can invest it in different things. You can put a lot of money into it. Uh, and the money is going to grow. And yeah, you, you're going to have to pay some taxes. But the biggest drawback, the biggest drawback of this type of account is the fact that it can be used for whatever the child wants it to be used for once the money is turned over to them. Okay, so this kind of tells you why I like the brokerage account, right? I like just using a simple brokerage account because I'm okay with paying taxes. Right. But I want control over the money. Yes. The 529, the ESA, they give you control of the money as the parent. Right. But the UTMA or UGMA does not give you control over the money. Well, I do want control over the money and how it's dispersed. So I do like the brokerage account. OK. Uh, what I do like about the UTMA and the UGMA account is that if your child has money that they want to put away for themselves, they want to invest or they want to save up for a car over time, or you want to teach them how to invest, then you can put money into an UTMA or UGMA for them and allow that money to grow, right? And then once they are 18, you know, 25, how, whatever the age is for that specific state, then you can let them have that money, right? And that would be a really good way to teach your child about investing. But I do not think it's where you should be putting uh, your money unless you want uh, your child to have full control over that money and full decision making over that money. Now, the good news is they can use it for whatever they need to use it for. If uh, you know they want to put a down payment on a house, they can do that. If they need to buy a new car, they can do that, right? But that's why I like the brokerage account again, because I can choose. I can choose if I want to gift you this money. If I want to gift you this money and allow you to buy a new car or put a down payment on a house or whatever, because it's my money. It's not uh, the child's money. But again, there are benefits to be had from all of these different types of accounts. Uh, there are downsides to all of these different accounts, uh, even the brokerage account. Okay, so I am on board with any of these that you choose. All I'm saying is you should be putting money away for your child's future in one way or another. But do not let the need to put away money for your child trump the need to put away money for yourself. You are going to need money to retire far more than your child is going to need money for their education. Okay, you are going to need money to retire far more than your child is going to need uh, some help once they're an adult. They can figure it out. They will be grown by that point okay but as I said on the outset I think it is important that we can give our kids a head start if you want to build generational wealth you want to do things in your family that are going to allow uh, wealth to be passed down from generation to generation and allow things to grow and not have to look back to the previous generation and give them help or handouts right the best way that you can do that and allow wealth to flow down to flow from parent to child uh, to their children, to their children, to their children, is to give your children 
a head start. And one of the best ways to do so uh, is by saving for their education and or uh, saving for any type of major event in their future. Okay, so just keep this in mind, right? Because investing for yourself is extremely important, but giving your whole family a head start can absolutely be done by saving for your children in a specific way. So thanks for tuning into this episode. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, and be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to create a financial plan that's specific to you and your family's needs and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just go to my website, www www.mnowithdylan.com. Click on the work with Dylan tab and you can choose the financial coaching session type that would work best for you. And we can begin pushing towards your long-term financial goals together. So tune in next week as I start talking about index funds. uh, And I will begin doing so by talking about the father of index funds, Jack Bogle. So thanks for tuning into this episode of Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. God bless.